So Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. That's a powerful statement. I remember I was in Aruba um, on vacation. And my vacations are kind of forced vacations. And they're always the will of God because my wife wants me to take them. And my wife is seldom wrong, I find, when it comes to what God's telling her for me. And she wanted me to go on vacation. So I think it was last year, maybe it was two years. No, I was locked down. I was frustrated because for some reason, you know me, I'm a, look, you see my books everywhere, right? I mean, even on this set, they raided my house and just plundered books like I wouldn't notice they're gone. And they're all over the set, like as props, which is very upsetting to me, but I'm not going to talk about that. It's just that every now and then I go looking for a book and I can't find it because it's, it's now a prop on the set. Anyway, if I, if I, like right, right behind here, if I, put, if I move this, You'll see all my books back there. Anyway, the point is, I went on vacation. And strangely enough, this is like not just a week or two. I promised Annabelle I'd give her like a month. We'd just get together for a month. And I thought, I'll write a book. You know, because it's like a good thing to do, right? Write a book. So I get down there, and I didn't bring any books with me. I don't know how this happened. I didn't bring a single book. I didn't. It was weird. I think that was the year where I, I, I just had a briefcase, a, a box or something I was going to take with me. It didn't make it onto the plane. I didn't even have my Bible. I was forlorn. And that was the year I took a Gideon Bible out of the hotel and marked it up. <laughs> I mean, I, I just went through the Gideon Bible. So I'm in the island, I thought, I'll go to a bookstore. They have no Christian books in Aruba. The whole nation. They even have great churches. Well, I should, let me put it this way. They're all in Spanish. For some reason, they're not in English. Well, I guess because they don't speak English all. So, the um, are kind of narcissistic American. Where <laughs> they're written in my language, there was only one book written in English. It was a Joel Osteen book. Now I'm going to confess something to you. I'm thinking a Joel Osteen book. Lord, I need something like you know, I got a book by Dutch Sheets or something, or Chuck Pierce or somebody I can stick my teeth into. Hear a little prophetic, you know, uh, you know, meat. Joel Osteen. Well, I'll tell you what. The Lord said to me, "You need Joel Osteen right now." It's kind of a humbling experience. I said, Joel, I, I watch him. I love him. I like him. But the Lord said, you need this. The entire book was so positive, it was like a detox. Everything he wrote was positive. And I realized how much I thrive on the contradictions, the complexities, the battles of big ideas. And as I read the book, I started to get convicted that I was missing something that Joel Osteen had. There's a reason why these guys are successful. They're meeting a need. And it's an anointed gift they got. So I'm reading where Joel says, you could say a lot of things, but always send your words in the direction you want to go in. Bam. I thought, now, if I was reading Kenneth Copeland or Kenneth Hagen or, you know, Jesse Duplantis, I mean, I like those guys. I believe, I believe when it comes to word of faith teaching, those guys actually have a revelation. But um, and then Joel Osteen comes from his dad, John Osteen, who was a word of faith preacher, a real strong, real godly man. And I thought, but isn't that what the Bible says? So when you're talking, your words have different missions. Um, but when you're, when you're speaking over your life, when you're praying over your purpose and your family, send your words out like messengers on a mission. Don't describe what's wrong, but send your words out in the direction of what you want to see manifest. That's a powerful statement. Now, I ran into a bunch of little Joel Osteen proverbs like that, and it really benefited me. And I felt like the Lord said, oh, God, there's a reason why you didn't bring everything else you got a Gideon Bible, you got Joel Osteen, and you got your wife, you got me, and we're going we're gonna to talk. And it really was a real clarifying, you know, uh, I was going to say exile, but it wasn't an exile. It was on an island of Aruba. It's hardly, a, hardly the island of Patmos, but Aruba. But uh, I, I, that was a perfect experience for me. Now, Jesus says, my words are spirit and they are life. You'll notice Jesus sending his words on missions to accomplish things. So there's this sense in which, on one hand, like I do news commentary, so I have to describe the reality of what is. But that doesn't mean that that is the final authority to dictate what will be. I have to be careful then to speak and to pray and to prophesy, if you will, what I believe God wants to see manifest. Because remember this, the whole prayer of a Christian is you're praying 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For some reason in our head, we think of this as being, we're praying for us to go to heaven. When in fact, God's whole burden of human government on the earth is, don't focus on leaving, focus on kingdom coming. And this is a real, this is like, we, religion has messed with our heads because we're always focused on the rapture and exiting. We're not focusing on the kingdom of God being manifest down here. So with that thought in mind, let's talk in this Bible study about the power of utterance and sending your words in the direction where you want your life to go. And a lot of that has to do with what gets your attention. I had an experience with a race car driver, Bob Bradbury, he's a friend of mine, and he was a great evangelist, great ministry, and a real power ministry. Lay hands on people and they just get it, the power of God would hit them. Kind of an interesting signs and wonders ministry, really. And uh, I talked about, I don't know, I would talk about different um, metaphors when I was doing my training and teaching, coaching with people, and I was talking about race car drivers. And he decided that rather than me talking about what I never experienced, he was going to put me doing hot laps. So I end up going off to a, a, a on my birthday, he kind of hijacks me. I don't know where we're going. We end up going to like a NASCAR racetrack up there in New England. And he had rented the track and a race car. And what I next thing I find, I have my friends that do this to me. I had, I had Mike Jacobs, Sidney Jacobs' husband, puts me in an airplane. I didn't know what we were doing for my birthday. I'm flying an airplane with an instructor. I went up for a flight instruction. He paid for me to get flight instruction so I know how to fly a plane, at least have a lesson doing it. Well, Bob Bradbury puts me in a race car, and I get suited up. I get the helmet on. It's fire retardant, which is really freaky because you don't normally put a suit on that is designed to protect you from fire. But then I realize, oh, my God, I'm in a combustible vehicle. I'm strapped in so that I have limited, you know, damage in case we roll over. This is getting very real. It's going from being a, a teaching illustration to being a, a, a life and instructor says, there's not a whole lot I could tell you, except I'll tell you what, uh, what, what most amateurs do that gets them hurt. He said, you're going to hit this lap. You're going to take off. You're going to go as fast as you can. That's what a racetrack is all about. And at a certain point, you're going to discover you don't have as much control over the vehicle as you want. Here's what I want you to know. You're going to, at a certain point, start to go towards the wall. The amateur hits the brakes and focuses on the wall because they're trying to avoid hitting it. He said the professional doesn't do that. The professional shifts their attention to the track because for some reason your vehicle will go where your focus flows. If you focus on the wall and what you're trying to avoid, you'll hit it. So think about this. If you focus on what you're trying to avoid, what you're trying to avoid is what you move towards. So, you know, and I thought about that for a second. I said, you know, I heard these guys that would describe on these long stretches of road out in Arizona where they find a Porsche wrapped around a telephone pole. Telephone poles are like 30 feet apart, 40 feet apart. How in the world does a, does a car wrap around a telephone pole? They're not every five feet. Well, what happens is if you're taking a corner, taking a curb, and you, and you, see, and, and you see that you're losing control, you focus on, the, on not hitting the telephone pole, and guess what you do? You end up somehow, you end up slamming the brakes, neutralizing the wheel, and you move right towards the thing, and cars get wrapped up around poles. So sure enough, man, I started spinning out, and the car would spin, and, uh, and I, would, uh, I would find myself fixated on hitting the wall because I was trying to avoid it. Then I learned try to try their approach, and I actually was able to pull out of the spins and get back on the track. But it was a lesson learned. Your focus determines your direction. Now think about your words in terms of not describing what it is you don't want to happen, but describing what you do want to happen. When we did around uh, 20 dream trips in the uh, Mexico, Cabo San Lucas, we did them in uh, other places. I don't know. We went to Lake Tahoe, I think, once. Went to San Diego. <clears throat> and uh, I, the, the awakening for me on that was I was taking a walk around the block, South Lake um, Keller, where I'm at in Texas. 
and I live in kind of like an area where in Texas is always hot. So if you're going to go for a walk, you go earlier or later in the day. And I remember walking around the block and, and I was praying. And I was praying, doing a prayer walk around the block. And I can remember talking about to the Lord about um, praying and asking the Lord for what we needed to do in the ministry where, where we're doing training and events but we had a cash flow problem. And sometimes I was in these locations where there'd be a mar mitzvah next door. I mean, I, I had it happen. I'd be doing conferences and there's music, a wedding. It's like, oh man, this is the hazards of doing them in a, in a rented facility. Somebody could be doing another event and you hear them through the wall. And I thought, I, and I was praying to the Lord about the challenges we were having in the work we were doing. And the Lord stops me. And this is it. Send your words in the direction you want to go not in the rehearsal of what you don't want. So the Lord said to me, pray the prayer in such a way that you frame what it is you want rather than what it is you don't want. Boom, it was like a revelation. You know, I had to walk, I kept walking like probably two or more, three laps around the neighborhood because I kept relapsing into the religious reflex of rehearsing something that was focusing on what I didn't want. Like instead of saying, Lord, we need, you know, Lord, we thank you that you're going to be providing the funds because we need this, we need this. The Lord said, that's one way to pray. How about this? Why don't you just describe what you want and ask me for it? I said, all right. I want to be able to have a perfect location, which is relaxing and exotic, and it's a getaway that I enjoy, others enjoy, where the work is like vacation, the vacation is like work, because we're in your presence, we're with people that want to be there, people that we want to be with, and that, it's, and that it's, it's flourishing and prosperous, and that we come home prospered rather than, uh, the, rather than fatigued. And the Lord said, there you go, where do you want to go? An exotic location. So I started describing it, and the next thing I realized is we were describing a dream trip, a trip that literally be a dream you have. The dream would be Go to, and at that point I found this like real palace, it was a great exotic location by the ocean there in Cabo San Lucas, and all the meals are included. I like the rooms, it's like kind of a windy, swept location, it's a really neat place. We go down there with 100 people, and I think it was like the whole week or something, or four or five days, but it was so economically priced, it was like $9.99 when we started, and it was all the meals included, and I, I don't know, the room included, however we did that. But it was like a really ideal situation where anyone could afford it, they could afford to fly there. And we would have an average of 100 people, and we'd hang out there, and I'd bring speakers down. It was like Ed Silvoso or, um, you know, uh, I had, man, Clarice Fluitt. We, I, I, the people, I had friends. I want, I want to hang out with some of my favorite speakers, let them come down and have a vacation with me, and I'll pay them. Well, we did like around 20 of these trips. And it came out of that principle of pray what you want, not what you're avoiding. Pray for Put your words in the direction of what you want to see happen, not what you don't want to see happen. And, and in order to do that, it's not like, a, not like a trick where it's like you're in your heart and in your head, you're all perplexed, but I'll manipulate God with the right kind of prayer. You literally have to get yourself in a place where you're seeing that, that you have authority to create the world the way you want it. And that your utterance, your words are containers and they authorize things to happen. They're like shells, bullets that go out. They contain something. My opening line in this, this Bible study, my words are spirit and they are life. The idea is that Jesus' words contain something. And so those words actually go forth. And you put those words out into the future. And they, in a sense, they send you, you send your words in the direction you want to move in. And if your words are, if the energy in them is mingled, they're not going to be successful. So you have, they have to come from a heart that is actually in alignment with what's coming out of your mouth. If your words are saying one thing but your heart's saying another, it's an impotent confession. And I think a lot of people try the word of faith and they try to speak things and they don't get the idea that it's not the words themselves, it's the spirit and life that comes out of your mouth. All right, Mercedes. Lance, what other verses support this idea of speaking to create, speaking to create your reality around you? So I think it would be important just to highlight different things throughout Scripture because I think it is modeled in there. But like to your point, it's so often not reflected. And I think our words create our reality. You know, one thing I love, we've got this guy Bobby Vitale in our life, and he is just like, he's always like fine-tuning phrases. And you sit in a room with him, he's like, oh, 
you know, or it's like, like, I'm like, well, I have to do this meeting. He goes, you get to do this meeting. And it's like, it's little things like that, you know, and you're like, okay, that's a quick reframe, quick reframe. And so, um, so more than even like these, you know, cause like self-help people do this or like the idea of like the secret or you're creating what's around you with your words. It's actually biblical principles. So that's why I was saying, I'd love for you to just maybe highlight a couple other verses where we were speaking to create our reality. Yeah. Okay. And, um, Actually, it, um, I'm going to find one for you that most people miss. And it's, uh, it's where, see if you can find it, Jonathan. It's where Jesus is at the Last Supper. And uh, he says, one of you is going to betray me. And Judas says, um, and they also, is it I? And then Judas says, is it I? And then Jesus says, it's as you said. Mm -hmm. Very powerful, missed little revelation there. Everyone said the same thing, but Jesus didn't hear their words. He heard their heart. And when Judas tried to use different words and fit in with the crowd, Jesus ferreted him out and said, yeah, you just said it. It wasn't your words. It's the spirit I heard. Mm. You're the one. Mm. I think too. Uh, where is that? Uh, it's going to be Matthew uh, chapter 26, verse 25. All right, Matthew 26. Let's just go there real quick. And Mercedes, I don't want to lose your point, but this is a really interesting verse. Matthew 26, 25? Uh, correct, yeah, 26, 25. All right, so Jesus is there at the Last Supper. And uh, as they were eating, in verse 21, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say, each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes, just as it was written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for him had he not ever been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And uh, he said to him, you have said it. Mm -hmm. Wow, you catch that? Most people miss it. They all said it, and none of them caught what just happened in that little transaction. Because all they heard was, Another guy's saying, am I the one? And Jesus says, yep, that's you. Yeah. And it's interesting, too. It's not in this gospel, but it's almost right after he says that Satan enters him. I think it's in John. Oh, it says that he said that, and then Satan entered him immediately. After and, he took the sop, Satan entered into him. Yeah. And then, and then Jesus says, what you must do, do, do it quickly. Yeah. What you do, do quickly. Yeah, Gosh, it's so freaky. So you've got Satan entering into an apostle's body because the apostle had already made room for that in his, in his compromise. And the only sin that Judas had that we know of was that he was a thief. He had the money purse, and he took money out of the purse. Do you know what I thought about the other day? Because I was reading Luke, and it was talking, it was talking about Judas. And I was thinking, because I was thinking the same thing, so... But wouldn't he been one of the 12 that were sent out and actually did signs and wonders? You know, when Jesus sends him out in twos and you know, they're like, Lord, even the demons obey us, you know, and, and healing's happening. Wouldn't he have also participated in that, been endued with power and even from that place still betrays, still has that in his heart to betray him? It really does. Um, it's interesting in a way. Why would Jesus put Judas in charge of the purse? when he knows that he's got a thief. And why would Jesus allow the person who's taking money out for his own personal use? Why would he allow him to, um, to stay in that role and not expose it? It's interesting. And, 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 there's a lot, and I don't want to go down that road now, but I did a blog post on this once in Facebook. Back in the days before videos spoiled me, and I used to actually have to think and write a lot. And uh, my take on that was after reading some other preachers on it, is that Jesus was giving him trust. And what the Lord does is he trusts you. And he knows you may abuse his trust. He knows you may abuse his freedom. But it, he does not withhold from you the opportunity to have responsibility and rewards. You just judge yourself when you don't behave properly with those privileges. 
but it's a sobering thing that he did it with Judas, he'll do it with you. Mm -hmm. He'll give you opportunity. And, and, and then you wonder, well, I don't wonder why the Lord, is, the Lord isn't judging me. Well, it could be like Judas. He isn't judging you because he's act, you're actually judging yourself mm -hmm. by dishonoring the opportunity he's given, the freedom he's given you. Totally. And what's, what's wild, too, is, you know, there that that's the verse that scares me the most, where it says, you know, that they'll stand before Jesus and say, well, we drove out demons in your name. We prophesied in your name. And Jesus will say to those people, away from me, for I never knew you. So you could be like there are people who could be like Judas that are even doing signs and wonders. That's why signs and wonders can't be an indication of someone's relationship with the Lord. And you see it a lot of times, right? In like corrupt ministry, you see that happen. And you're like, what, what's going on? And, but yet the gifts are given without revoke. So anyways, I just think all of that's really wild. And, and, and it should produce a fear of the Lord. It's, that's what, that's why the, I want to get to. The yeah. byproduct is not that God's asleep and, and, you know, not paying attention. It's that, hey man, it all, it's all in the book. But back to your original question about are there other verses that talk about the power of words themselves? I want to give you two real quick because we only have seven minutes left here. Uh, the classic one is from Matthew or from Mark chapter uh, 11. And it was in the morning, verse 20, as they passed by, they saw a fig tree dried up from the roots. And uh, Peter said, oh, okay, actually, you've got to go back to verse 12. The next day, Mark 11, 12, when they had come out from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree <clears throat> having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. It wasn't the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Can you answer a question for me? I never understand this. So there's no figs, but it's not even the season for figs. And then Jesus still curses it. What's up with that? I know Bill Johnson has teaching on that. I'll just refer you to Okay. Him. <laughs> I only got six minutes, okay. so I can't go down that rabbit hole right now. Well, we can keep going. We just put Jesus has the right to expect supernatural fruit when he when, right, when, when he walks in the room. There better be figs. Yeah, ba basically, if, if 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 the Son of God wants it, he can get it. Yeah. Unless you unless you have the freedom to not give him what he wants, mm. and if you withhold your obedience from him, then he'll accept your you're not going to give him what he wants. Mm. So um, it's just kind of. But let's go with what uh, yep, go for the it. original keep going. Bible keep study. Going. Now in the morning. Uh, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up, here's the key, from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. It's like, hey, look at it. This is what you, remember, you spoke to it yesterday, and now the green, I mean, literally overnight, it shriveled up, the whole tree. Jesus answered and said to him, have faith in God. This is weird, because the whole teaching of having faith in God has to do with cursing something at the invisible level until it's visibly manifest. Hmm. It was dried up, not from the leaf, but from the root. The moment Jesus spoke, the root was hit. What was under the surface in the spirit realm is affected first by your utterance, and then the physical realm is manifest. But it starts in the invisible realm is what's being taught here. So, the, so Rabbi, look, the, the, the fig tree which you cursed is withered away. And it, it only could be by divine revelation that Mark got. It was dried up from the roots. How did he know? It was as he wrote it. The Holy Spirit revealed to him. It was, it started in the roots up. And Peter makes that comment. So Jesus says, have faith in God. And many people have had a problem with this in the original language because it says, have, it's all in the idiom, it's all in the grammar. Have faith of God, have faith in God, have God's faith. It's all variously described. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And then if you're standing and praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them that your Father in heaven may forgive you. Because if you don't forgive then others, then neither will your Father in heaven forgive you. Ooh. Interesting whole package here, which we got just a few minutes to unpack. Notice, Jesus says that he spoke words and he didn't doubt in his heart that what he said was going to come to pass. And he sent his words on a mission to accomplish something. And they came right from the heart of, to the root of the issue. And what he's, and, but I want you to catch this. It doesn't say, shall not doubt in his head. 
but shall not doubt in his heart. Now, this is where most people miss it. I heard Dottie Osteen, Joel Osteen's mother, tie him back in here, give the most remarkable explanation of this. She with this cancer. He wasn't there to stand in agreement with her. And, but she had taught him, heard him teach on faith and the word of faith for years. And here's what she did, Mercedes. In her head, she noticed the symptoms. In her head, she could see the symptoms and feel them. And she said, where most people miss it is, it's not have no doubt in your head because your head is under siege. Your head is exposed to your heart where you keep the faith. Mm. So your head, you could say, look, I'm having a battle right up here, but down here, I'm feeding myself on the word of God. I know what God wants and I believe it's going to happen a certain way. So you're not doubting, not in your head, but in your heart, which means the deepest part of you actually is in agreement with the outcome. Even though your head is up and down and in and out, which is a powerful delineation on this. I never heard people teach. So they said to her, well, have you gone to the doctor and confirmed that you're cancer-free? She goes, no, I never did. I never, I stopped taking, I stopped going to the doctor. I, when, he, when he said it's over, I just said, well, they're going to pull me through. I've been believing in my heart. I'm healed. And I never went back to the doctor. No, it's 30 years later. I haven't been there. Well, it doesn't really matter. Hmm. She didn't go in because yeah. she wasn't the doctor's verdict. She didn't need more information in her head anyway. Her heart told her something different. Mm. So catch this again. You have to believe in your heart, not your head. Where In your head, you could start to whittle down the doubt and start to starve it. But you don't, sometimes you're in a race against time. You don't have enough time to totally beat your head game. You've got to go to the heart of it and get a word from God and hold and nurture in your heart in spite of symptoms. In my heart, I'm holding on to something. And then believe in your own utterance. Because it does not doubt in his heart, but believes the thing he says comes to pass. Mm. That means you have to actually have confidence that your words have power. You can't be saying, well, I'll try it. If you try it, it's like having a gun and going, I don't know if it shoots or doesn't. Well, try it. Shoot it. If it's a physical gun, boom, consequences come out. So what the Bible's saying here is, Believe that the things that come out of your mouth have an effect. Mm. So it might start with you getting a revelation that the law of utterance is a sacred phenomenon. God says, oh, trust me, your words actually have consequence. Speak the wrong thing in a crowded room and see what happens. Speak the wrong thing to your spouse and watch the wrong thing over yourself. Mm -hmm. Speak the wrong thing to God. And this goes into one final piece that I think is incredibly important. And it's in Daniel. Jonathan, look up the verse. I have come for thy words. Daniel chapter 9, where he's praying. So Daniel is in intercession, and he's praying and wrestling over the fate of his nation. He is in exile in Babylon. He's experiencing in his head contradictions because he's battling the prince of Persia. But in his heart, he is holding on to God and speaking and praying as a prophet. And as he's praying... The angel Gabriel, being caused to fly swiftly, comes to him and says, Fear not, Daniel, for uh, I have come for thy words. Where's the verse? Uh, Daniel chapter 10, verse 12. Well, I wasn't too far off. No. Daniel chapter 10, verse 12. Correct. We're going to go there right now, people. Daniel chapter 10, verse 12. So here we go. Suddenly a hand touched me, verse 10, made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And the angel said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And while he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. And um, uh, he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come Look at this, because of your words. Notice something. Chapter 9, verse 23. Go there for a second. The angel comes and says, at the beginning of your supplication, the command went out, and I've come to tell you. You're greatly beloved. At the beginning of your supplication. You ever wonder why God isn't answering your prayer? How about this? He answered your prayer, resisting it. And the angel says, the moment you prayed that prayer, I, I was sent with healing. The moment you prayed that prayer, I was sent with the money you needed. The moment you prayed that prayer, I was sent with deliverance for your family. But I was delayed. I was hindered. Satan used every accusation, every stratagem, every legal tactic to try to slow me down. 
but I have come because your words pulled me through the battle. How important is it that you don't screw up what comes out of your mouth while you're in the delay facing the contradiction? You're going to find out when you get to heaven. God sent what you needed the moment you prayed. There was a resistance. Maybe you fed into that resistance over your course of your life. Certain obstructions were there, and God was working his way through. If you'll stay in faith and you'll stick with the confession of what God originally put in your mouth and don't waver in it, it fuels your angel in the battle until it breaks through And then we find out the principality of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But your words, you would not let go for 21 days. You kept hammering and your faith-filled intercession caused Michael to get reassigned from his battalion to mine. Whenever it mentions an angel, it's not mentioning the angel. Here's a little revelation on how angels work. They are hosts of heaven. That means that if Caesar's on the field, the entire Roman legion is with him. If Alexander is on the field, the entire Alexandrian cavalry is with him. When Michael shows up, his battalion shows up with him. Daniel was praying something that was going to shift the activity of God strategically in history. Therefore, angels were sent to break through against battalions of darkness in position over the nations. So you have no idea how one lonely intercessor on an assignment, not backing down and compromising, can have words that will pull your angel through. And you'll find out the first day you said that prayer under the anointing, heaven said, yes, you just had to have a 21-day delay. This is the hard part for a weak church, dealing with instantaneous answers and explanations and resolutions with very little investment put in for the consequential things we're asking for. I love all this, Lance. I was thinking, too, about Genesis, how we're made in the image of a creator God, and how does God create? He speaks things into being. So we're very much made in the image of God, so we, too, speak when we create. And I think, too, not only do we have to be mindful about what we're saying over ourselves, I think we have to be self-aware about what other, people's have, what other people have said over us. So there's like the idea of a word curse. Like when, the, when God says like, don't curse. Like I don't think he's necessarily thinking about all the curse words in English, all the curse words in Spanish. I think he's meaning also our utterance of what we're speaking over other people and being aware of what other people are speaking over us. So if you weren't raised with the best parents, I mean, you could have been word cursed a good portion of your life. Like you're, you know, like you're so dumb or you'll never figure that out. Or, you know, you, you've got two left feet. I mean, things like that, that it seems little, but it starts to speak to people. It starts to, it starts to ingrain and become part of their identity, which is why it's so important to know the word of God, to know what God says about you, and then to confess those things over yourself. And I think too, break off all those word curses, you know, even friends that you grow up with. It's amazing how it's like, it's almost like we're like, um, like static cling, you know, and like certain things start to stick to us. And if we don't remove them, you know, I think it holds you back in your true identity. And that goes to something which I've uh, done on occasion. When I'm ministering to someone, I'm stand up. And it's a strange thing to do. But I feel like it's a prophetic act. I literally sweep over their back and pray that all backstabbing, all betrayal, all words spoken behind their back will be broken off. Because, you know, I, I, it's, a, it's a strange analogy, but... Um, I got a, a barber, and one of her clients is, uh, is, is a chief of police, and he's got a taser. And she said, show me how the taser works. And so he backs her up, and he, whatever he aims at, the taser sticks to it. So he, it could be any object, not just humans. Boom, the floor. Boom, the bookcase. Boom, the TV set. And once it goes, it, it's, it, it delivers the voltage. And, uh, and, and so I realized something as she's talking that people can speak spiritually empowered utterance targeting you. And one of the reasons why you've got to learn how to, the way that you break all these things off you is because those taser words are stuck on you and you don't even, you're walking along and all of a sudden someone is released because if this works for the kingdom, how does a a Satanist, a witch, or even an an unsuspecting Christian become a vehicle for the devil? That's what slander is. Mm -hmm. That's what the accuser of the brethren does. He he accuses the brethren through the mouth of the brethren. 
So you get those words on, and sometimes you wonder why it is, why it is you're not yourself. Well, for all you know, there's the, un, the unseen realm, and that you need that divine hand to sweep over your back and break that stuff up. By the way, this is one of the words that describes God in the Hebrew. I am your rear guard. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. Abraham had that revelation from God. God said, you know what? You picked up some fights here that are going to be getting you in trouble in the future. You got these kings. They're not going to forget what you did to them when you're 300. When they figure out you're only 300, they might come for revenge. But I am your rear guard. God said, I'll protect your back because you're vulnerable. Your back is, is vulnerable to betrayal. So I would like to say one more thing. We're seven minutes over this Bible study, but it's important. What can short circuit the power of your faith in your words or your heart to believe is uh, meditate upon the word of God day and night so at least you're giving your brain something that it can feed on to push out the doubt and the unbelief. You've got to give your brain fuel. But the thing that, gee, thing that can short circuit the power of divine utterance and confession is unresolved bitterness, resentment, and unforgiveness towards what other people have done to you. That's the weird thing, huh? So in the courts of heaven, if there's a trial going on and Satan can hold back a blessing, he's going to bring up, what about them and their attitude towards so-and-so? That becomes the argument Satan uses for 21 days of delay. Which is interesting to me that in chapter 9, as we close out, you want to know how to pray for America? And we talked about this before, Mercedes. You're more tuned in on this than me because I maybe need to be more convicted on this. But your thing is, hey, we're hearing a whole lot of Christians in the battle over what's happening in America, and they actually hate Democrats. Mm -hmm. they, you know, we, pr we talk about this basket of people that, we're, that, that are all the characters we don't like, like, like we're authorized to hate them and curse them. Actually, that could, be, that could actually nullify your own prayers if I'm reading the Bible right. You could be screwing up your own intercession. So what does Daniel tell us about how to pray for America? He prays in chapter 9. And he sets, what was the words he was praying that caused Gabriel to break through? What was his faith-filled words? They were actually words of intercession. So Daniel is praying when a Gabriel breaks in and says, I got here. Your words pulled me through. What was he praying? He was speaking and praying, verse 20, chapter 9, confessing his sins and the sins of his people, presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. While I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in a vision at the beginning, being caught to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the eating sacrifice and informed me and said, Daniel, now I'm getting every supplication I was sent, uh, and I've come, for you are greatly beloved. Look at Daniel's uh, words. He prays here in um, verse 15. O now, Lord God, who brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself the name as it is this day, we have sinned, we have done wickedly. You could say, O Lord God, that planted, you know, pilgrims on this shore, that constructed a cross in Jamestown in 1516 to, you know, to uh, 1615 for the nation to be for your glory. What have we done with your glory? We perverted it. We turned your prosperity into selfishness. Oh, Lord God, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, from the United States. So let's just rewrite this in substance. This is how you're supposed to pray. Your holy mountain, because of our sins, because of the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are now a reproach. Therefore, God, hear the prayer of your servant and supplications, for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on this sanctuary, this nation, this last hope of freedom which is becoming desolate. Oh, my God, incline your ear and hear, open your eyes and see. Look at our dislocations, our distress. Look at the condition of our cities, which is called by your name, for we don't present our supplication because of our righteousness, because we've been done wrong. It's because of your mercy we're making this argument, we're making this plea. Lord God, hear. You can hear the sob. Lord God, forgive. You could hear the sob. Lord God, listen, sob, and act. Do not delay for your own sake, for your city, for your people. Your, notice it's all about God's glory, God's people, God and how they lie and how they... That prayer actually in voltage is a low voltage prayer. The high voltage prayer is your nation, your people, 
your glory, your purpose, your reputation. And while I was speaking, an archangel broke through with a battalion and said, phew, that was hard. He said, but guess what? We made progress. You're going to win. That's the message today. Send your words, send your prayers, send your faith in the direction of what you want to see manifest. Rehearse what you want, not what you don't want. And, uh, and understand the biblical formula for breakthrough.